So when I started this series, I mentioned how it was based loosely off of the format of series like Age of Heroes over at the AV Club. And one of the pieces that always stood out to me in that series, which looks back at the most important superhero film of every year, was the year for 2008. That was the year that two pivotal superhero films came out, The Dark Knight and Iron Man. Do you give the nod to Iron Man, the first in what would eventually become one of the biggest franchises in the world, or do you give it to The Dark Knight, a film that dominated the cultural conversation and was almost certainly a better movie overall? And in 1996, I feel like we have a similar situation for this show. That year, both Quake and Duke Nukem 3D released. The former is a hugely influential title from a technical perspective, made by the very people that popularized the whole genre, and the latter was a game that finally figured out how to convey character in first person, while also grounding a genre that, until this point, felt very abstract. Both are games that cast very long shadows, but in very different ways. Which one should get the nod for 1996? Well, I already did a whole video on Quake, and while the video is a little old and cringy at this point, I largely stand by what I said there, especially with regards to the game being more about tone than anything else. Quake remains a phenomenal tone piece. It's all gothic castles and industrial machinery, crumbling temples to ancient gods under gray-purple skies, fetid and flooded caverns thick with the stench of the dead, and bluestone spires overlooking worlds named things like the Palace of Hate and the Grizzly Grotto and Gloom Keep. The Nine Inch Nails soundtrack lays out a disquieting soundscape that matches the visuals, with chilling whispers, heavy breathing, and theremin-like whimpers mixed in with mechanical beeps or percussive thumps. <laughs> But even without the music, the game's sound design by Trent Reznor just has this character to it, sharp and metallic and pained. Quake is angsty and angry and sad all at once, and as I've said before, it is very much the teenager emotional experience as an FPS title. It's a great title to go and play to just feel those feelings in a game that both feels them back and tries to give you a little catharsis on the way. And in addition to being a great game to vibe to, it's hard to deny Quake's importance, at least in terms of how it laid the groundwork for the next decade or more of video games on the personal computer. It wasn't just the latest id game, but in some sense a bunch of technological experiments conducted by id's engineers to figure out the best way to design and render their games going forward. For example, while the original release of Quake was a strictly software-rendered affair, the release of GL Quake configured the engine to use OpenGL's libraries and thus made Quake the first id game to support hardware-based rendering. And unlike Doom's peer-to-peer -peer multiplayer, Quake had switched over to a client-server design. This was actually meant to mostly improve latency at LAN parties or on school and office networks, because that's where Doom multiplayer had found a lot of its success. But it was actually so popular with the broader internet that it eventually released Quake World. Quake World was a multiplayer-only version of Quake that attempted to improve internet-based multiplayer by introducing concepts like client-side prediction of what the state of the game would be, even if it hadn't received a packet describing the state of the game from the server for a few hundred milliseconds. This made playing Quake multiplayer on your home dial-up connection pretty feasible. You may have 500 or so milliseconds of latency, but it wasn't a stuttering mess of teleporting around most of the time. Suddenly, it was no longer just college campuses on T1 lines and bored office workers that could play multiplayer first-person games, but anyone with a dial-up account. And that's really huge. And because of id's continued support of the mod community, combined with the popular and fluid multiplayer, we got Capture the Flag and Team Fortress mods, the former of which would become a first-person staple for years to come, and the latter of which would break off into a huge franchise in its own right. And the engine would not only be an ancestor to future id tech revisions and the games that it powered, but also Half-Life's Gold Source engine, which would eventually become Source. There's probably almost no trace of it left now, but this is the great granddaddy of a lot of game tech. All of this adds up to Quake being this really seminal work, a shooter with a rock star soundtrack and a killer vibe, a game that established so much of how this genre was going to play out for the next decade or more. 
but it's also a bit basic. While it represented the solidifying of the id tech that would drive a ton of games over the coming years, the game itself is kind of just okay. Let's put it this way. There's a reason just about every official Doom release short of the mobile RPG games has been ported to Switch, but not a single Quake game has been ported to Switch. There's also a reason we haven't really seen a Quake reboot in the way we've seen a Doom reboot. It's a massively important game, and it's an insanely good game to just feel angsty in, but it's also kind of a salvage title that had a tortured development and bears those scars. The idea for Quake, or at least what Quake was originally supposed to be, was kicking around at the id offices as early as the Commander Keen days. It was going to be a title inspired by id Software's D&D sessions, where you would play as Quake, the warrior who wields the hammer of thunderbolts, capable of destroying whole buildings in a single swing. Basically, Mjolnir. It was planned to be a grand action role-playing game where there were NPCs that weren't just enemy combatants, and you had a relationship with a parasitic creature known as the Hellgate Cube. Quoting an enthusiastic John Romero hyping up the project while Doom 2 was still in development, quote, You're going to have this trans-dimensional artifact, the Hellgate Cube, a cube that orbits your head, and it will just do things. It'll have its personality and its own programming to where you feel like it's a different entity. It'll attack people if you're good to it, if you're whacking on someone and taking damage off someone, then the cube feeds off of pain basically in a certain distance around it, so the more pain you do, the happier the cube is, so it will start doing things for you. It'll heal you when you get screwed up, or it'll teleport you somewhere else. And if you don't fight for a long time, it'll start damaging you, or it would take off, and maybe it'll come back one day. And, yeah, the idea of an entity that spins around your head and feasts upon the pain you cause enemies, forcing you to engage in constant combat, is silly and sophomoric, but it was also very different from what id had done in the past. They really were shooting for this grand role-playing game where things weren't just targets. Or at least, not everything was a target. But the project dragged on for months, with supposedly little to show from the design team as they waited for the engine to solidify. Remember, this is a software house that just a few years prior was producing upwards of 10 titles a year. Now they had slowed to not producing a new title in a year and a half. By today's standards, that's nothing. Even a lot of indie titles take three or more years to come to fruition. But for the id team in the mid-90s, it felt like an irresponsible amount of time. Pressure began to mount internally, and eventually the decision was made to abandon the ambitious role-playing game. That could come later, when the technology was settled. For now, it was important to just ship something. And I think this decision is a critical one in the history of id Software. It was the moment they stopped being a game development house and shifted over to becoming a technology house that produced only high-energy, game-feel-driven shooters designed to highlight the engine's strengths and that treated story the way that Carmack had always suggested they do. Like a porno did, there to serve the action and nothing more. Quake was by no means the end of id Software. They would continue to produce massively popular shooters up through, well, now, really. But it was kind of the point at which this company, run by a few young guys, fate had thrown together to make whatever interested them, turned into something else. Quake wasn't a bold step forward for id, but a retreat to the safe and the known. And in the game of Quake, this pivot is obvious. The asset teams had been hard at work on a medieval melee title and were now being asked to make a Cyber Space Marines game as they transitioned back towards something like Doom. This resulted in a confused game that mixed knights in armor with cyber troopers, Lovecraftian floaty things with attacking Rottweilers, and cement military bases with cobblestone chapels. The dialogue at the end of each episode limply attempts to paper over all of this and provide some modest context for the carnage, and it feels like what it probably is overwritten Dungeon Master narration? For example, The charred viscera of diabolic horrors bubble viscously as you seize the rune of hell magic. Its heat scorches your hand, and its terrible secrets blight your mind. Gathering the shreds of your courage, you shake the devil's shackles from your soul and become ever more hard and determined to destroy the hideous creatures whose mere existence threatens the souls and psyches of all the population of Earth. It feels very Dungeon Master telling their group how to feel about what just happened and not very, here is some plot. And the selection of weapons has even less breadth and playfulness than Doom. It amounted to a shotgun, bigger shotgun, nail gun, bigger nail gun, bouncy rockets, straight rockets, and a lightning gun, which is the only one that feels playful and more than perfunctory with its high damage, ridiculous ammo burn, and discharge this in water and everyone dies gimmick. 
However, the game does a good job of hiding how basic its arsenal is by making the way you have to engage with its enemies varied. Players need to trick ogres into long melee animations that leave them vulnerable to attack, strafe in order to avoid the lunge of a fiend, use rockets and grenades to jib zombies so that they can't come back from the dead, keep their distance from bouncing spawns, and use cover where possible to avoid shamblers. The game plays well, it's just basic because it was pared down from a different, grander vision that we'll never know. And is it right to list Quake as the first person title of 1996 for what are mostly technical achievements that others would build on? Especially when its game design is rooted in its developers intentionally retreading the safe and the known? What about a game that has very little in the way of technical achievements, but had lasting design contributions that did new things, even if they were rough or literally crude? Enter Duke Nukem 3D. It is, in a lot of ways, the opposite of Quake. It ran on a version of Ken Silverman's build engine, which still used sectors and sprites as opposed to Quake's much-touted full 3D. And it didn't support the forward-looking multiplayer technology that Quake did, relying on services like the Total Entertainment Network to serve as its primary means of playing over the internet. That's not to say Duke matches didn't get played, but they were more a staple of office and college networks like Doom before it, not really something that broke out to the internet at large because that required a paid service. And where Quake's mechanic design felt intentional, if utilitarian, Duke Nukem 3D's combat felt far more slapdash. Most of the enemies use hitscan weapons, so defensive play isn't really an option. You're going to be taking damage. So the game is more about taking out enemies as fast as possible to minimize that damage, while still saving your most powerful ammunition for the heavy hitters. It's more of a resource juggling game that pits health, items, ammo, and how much you're willing to cheese and save scum all against one another, which is a lot more loose and sloppy than Quake's focus on using movement, aim, and weapon selection to counter each particular enemy style. Duke Nukem 3D's emphasis wasn't really on the combat system so much as its bizarre weapons. Ian Danskin over at Innuendo Studios did a great video on this 90s approach to weapon design that he called The Arsenal, and I think that's a fitting name. And while the idea of the arsenal itself arguably started with Doom, Duke Nukem 3D was the game that really emphasized the need for there to be absurd, novel weapons in your first-person game. There was a freeze thrower that encased enemies in ice and let you have a Terminator 2 moment whenever you wanted to feel like a badass and really punctuate an action scene. There's the Devastator, a rapid-fire rocket launcher that isn't all that interesting to use, but does do hilarious levels of damage. There are laser trip mines and pipe bombs for setting traps, and the pipe bombs could be rolled into otherwise inaccessible areas. There's even a mad scientist style shrink ray that makes your enemies doll sized so that you can just step on them to finish them off. And in addition to weapons, there was an inventory of gadgets, jetpacks to explore otherwise impossible to get to areas, and night vision goggles that paint the world bright green, and steroids that make you run super fast for some reason. They're all cheesy, and most feel included because they're cool on paper more than the game having any actual use for them, but they're fun to use, where Quake's weapons felt rigid and elementary. If Quake loves its monsters and designs around how you're supposed to interact with them, Duke Nukem 3D loves its toys and designs around how neat it would be to use them in absurd situations. But I think the most important difference between the two games was that where Quake embraced abstraction to sell its seething melancholy mood, Duke Nukem 3D adhered to an almost slavish literalism. More than any other title I've covered in this series to date, Duke Nukem 3D captured spaces that felt like you could visit them. It takes place on street corners, and in movie theaters, and bars, and bank vaults, and canyons. Even the game's second episode, which takes place almost exclusively on space stations, takes time to build out crew quarters, and airlocks, and control rooms, and bathrooms, so that when you reach the green, slimy alien ships, they are totally abstract, and it feels alien. Duke Nukem's world wasn't one of evocative iconography trying to elicit an emotional response, but one of concrete and glass, bathroom stalls and office cubicles. It was, if not our world, of our world in a way that Quake goes out of its way to fundamentally reject. And it's not just the pseudo-post-apocalyptic LA setting and the furniture. The game simulated tiny little nonsense interactions that other games wouldn't bother to. Like, it's not just that bathrooms existed, although existing was a big deal, it's that they had stalls whose doors would open, and the toilets could be flushed and even used. Ah, much better. 
and they could be broken, and you could drink the water that poured out for health. Occasionally, you would encounter enemies using the facilities. Rooms had light switches that functioned as you'd expect, and often enough, those light sources could be broken. The sector-based lighting even let level designers fake shadows and use dramatic lighting in really effective ways that programmatic lighting was years away from emulating. The game had functional mirrors, a rarity to this day due to the performance cost. And while it wasn't procedural and only happened in areas the level designer deemed it appropriate, walls could be shot out in a way that made environments feel malleable and even interconnected when you could open up new pathways with explosions. Heck, in the second level of the first episode, you demolish an entire building. Bullets left bullet holes, glass could be shattered, pool balls could be knocked around, blood spurted onto walls, monitors and televisions could be shot out, and walking through liquid would leave little footprints behind you. And I'm struggling to put into words what this felt like to experience at the time. I know it doesn't seem like much now. The blocky furniture and low resolution textures don't impart as much of a sense of a real lived in place as, say, the latest Resident Evil. But you have to understand that in 1996, most first-person spaces were still incredibly abstract. Whether it was Marathon spaceship corridors, or Descent's tunnel systems, or Doom's techno-demonic hellscapes, they rarely felt like the places they were meant to be, if they were meant to be real places at all. Most were just spaces to facilitate gameplay mechanics. Duke Nukem 3D, on the other hand, set its shooter in the real, the banal, the relatable. And the horizons of what a first-person game could be about, and where they could be set, were expanded when it arrived. I would caution, however, against reading too much into the decision to set the game in this grounded reality. It is probably a result of the game's inspirations. Like Doom before it, Duke Nukem 3D is, in a lot of ways, a compilation of the interests of its developers. But where Doom melted all of its sources down and emerged as its own unique alloy, Duke Nukem 3D just kind of wears its influences on its sleeve. There are a few games, like Doom, that get name-dropped. Hmm, that's one doomed space marine. But mostly it's pulling from R-rated 80s action movies. It's shooting to be Robocop, or They Live, or Die Hard, or Commando, but more than anything it ends up giving off the same energy that emanates from the sort of VHS trash you'd see on Best of the Worst. Full of blood and boobies and swearing, all set in a grimy version of Los Angeles where so many of them were shot. It's not grounded because the developers had any real interest in day-to-day -day human life, it's grounded because it was mimicking movies set in Hollywood's backyard where it was cheapest for them to film them. Glass and other items were breakable because it looks cool when it happens in an explosion or in a gunfight. Toilets were usable because it was funny. This is also a game where the raptor enemies can literally just throw feces at you, so that's just its sense of humor. And a lot of these interactions are only there because the game's low fidelity made it cheap and quick to add. This trend of every little object being interactable in really shallow ways would continue through maybe 1998 with Half-Life and Sin, and after that would fade as even simple things like animating a toilet flushing would become days-long animation particle and foley projects. My god, what are you doing? Nowadays, if you're going to be simulating the minutia of day-to-day -day life, you're doing it intentionally in games like Gone Home or The Opening of Soma, titles that want to draw focus on the mundane for one reason or another, not because toilets are funny and it was cheap to do the gag. These 80s movie influences are also what led to Duke Nukem's character, which... I suppose we should address at least a bit, both because he's a controversial figure and because it was one of the lasting contributions the game made to other first-person titles. So, Duke Nukem was always a bit of a comedic character, but in his first three games he appears very differently. In the original Duke Nukem, he's basically just a musclehead, with the comedy drawing from the broad superhero absurdism inherent in an action man named Duke Nukem fighting an enemy named Dr. Proton. 
In Duke Nukem 2, the entire game is a lot more outlandish and blatantly comedic. He is abducted on live TV while shirtless and promoting his book, Why I'm So Great. After being tossed in a cell, he escapes with his secret explodo molar that the stupid aliens forgot to check his mouth for. The joke here isn't that the plot of the game is self-serious video game nonsense, it's that Duke Nukem is sort of a self-absorbed ass. It's also the only one of the three games that Tom Hall is credited on, and while his credit on Duke Nukem 2 is just creative stuff, I can't help but sense his fingerprints all over this intro, and I kind of love it. And then we have Duke Nukem 3D. Duke's comedic self-absorption is still kinda there, but it's toned way down. He just occasionally utters, damn I'm good, to himself, and compliments himself on how attractive he is in the mirror. Damn, I'm looking good. But more than the previous two games, Duke 3D explicitly makes him an amalgam of archetypical 80s action heroes. The tall, white, muscle-bound ubermensch who has never met a problem he can't solve with a firearm and a snappy one-liner. He is the personalities of John McClane, Snake Plissken, John Nada, and above all, Ash Williams, all rolled into the body of a Schwarzenegger or Stallone or Lundgren. And it's not even hidden. His catchphrases are all just lifted from the movies that inspired him. Groovy. Groovy. Who wants some? Who wants some? Come get some. Come get some. Hail to the king, baby. Hail to the king, baby. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. It's time to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And I'm all out of gum. This leaves Duke without much of a character. He's just a pile of stolen catchphrases in a muscle suit saying, Damn, I'm cool. So, do you guys like Sam Raimi movies? And it's the very fact that there's nothing to him, other than being the protagonist of this game, that I think lets him be the lightning rod for what should be the excesses of the developers rather than the character. Like, don't get me wrong, Duke definitely has strong guy at the office who talks a little too often and a little too loudly about going to strip clubs every weekend energy. But the same 80s VHS junk influence that led to spouting one-liners and believable environments is also what led to the game's inescapable sexism. The film referenced throughout the game from the very first level is Attack of the Bleached Blonde Biker Bimbos. There are naked women in cheesecake poses tied up by the aliens all throughout the game. And that's not great to begin with, but then to have them whimper, Kill me because the devs thought Aliens was a cool movie, but then give you no way to save them other than, yeah, killing them is really messed up. This is a game where you have more varied interactions with toilets than any woman you meet. Shake it, baby. Shake it, baby. Shake it, baby. And while Duke is the hero of this sexist universe, I feel like just saying, well, Duke Nukem is kind of a sexist dude, sidesteps the fact that decisions were made in the design of this game and its universe that go beyond Duke Nukem himself calling women babes and chicks. It is endemic to the whole game, from the level design to the system's design to the writing of Duke Nukem himself. But regardless of how you feel about Duke Nukem the character, his presence in Duke Nukem 3D marked the arrival of the first-person protagonist in a way we didn't have before, a fully voiced presence that dynamically responds to the events of the game world. <laughs> To be clear, voice acting in games, even first-person games, predates Duke Nukem 3D. It's just that this is the first time such techniques had been applied to what at the time would have been called a Doom clone, rather than an adventure title or something else with slower mechanics. And much like its representational environments, it opened up major storytelling possibilities whether Duke Nukem 3D used it for that purpose or not. Damn, that's the second time those alien bastards shot up my ride. It acclimated people to the idea of hearing a voice from a character you couldn't see on screen because you were seeing out of their eyes. Born to be wild. It convinced developers that you could have in-game dialogue responding to game events without it looping so much as to be grating. And it was so effective at delivering character beats, it's almost exclusively how Duke Nukem built his whole persona. In the short term, this technique would mostly be used to promote over-the-top offensive characters, Lo Wang in the incredibly racist Shadow Warrior, and Leonard in Zatrix's Redneck Rampage, for example. Hot damn! You screw with the bull, you get the horn. 
But in time, it would become a standard way of doing character work, exposition, and even forwarding plot in-game. So of the two, Quake and Duke Nukem 3D, which one deserves the title of the most important game of 1996? I think it largely comes down to context and what you mean by important. For posterity, the answer is probably Quake. It had a direct impact on so many titles, began popularizing online multiplayer, and holds up on replays to this day. It resulted in John Romero leaving the company and cemented id as a first-person shooter factory that focused on technology rather than stories or design. It is a hugely important, pivotal game for pretty much the whole genre. And hey, bonus, it wasn't incredibly degrading to women, so there's that. But for me personally, well, I remember spending the entire summer of 1997 editing Duke Nukem 3D and Quake levels on my family computer with friends. And making Quake levels always felt difficult. Inevitably, we'd end up with a hole in the map so the whole thing would render full bright, and making anything of interest was hard when your only textures were skulls and rotting wood and cobblestone. It mostly felt like we were working very hard to make purple-brown geometry mush. So we ended up spending most of our time working on Duke Nukem 3D levels. We would stay up until 2 or 3 in the morning for weeks at a time, working on a model of our school, of our houses, of the public library, of theme parks we made up in our heads, of cities we'd never been to but would like to explore. The game's sector-based engine made building geometry quick and painless, and the texture sets allowed us to build up a classroom or house or library easily out of the box. Over some warm summer nights in front of the glow of a CRT, I fell in love with creating small 3D spaces that were, to me, whole new worlds. Yeah, it was a shooter, and therefore the content was inherently violent, and looking back, that kind of sucks. But these days, kids would do something similar in Minecraft or Roblox or other more kid-friendly environment. We just didn't have those. We were using the tools we had to express ourselves in this exciting new way our parents could never understand. It led to a lifetime of fascination with games and, in one way or another, led to the show. I don't think I really got what Quake was trying to do until I was an adult and could approach it on its own abstract terms. But Duke Nukem 3D gave me what I needed then, in the moment of 1996. So while Quake is probably the game that officially gets the nod for that year, Duke Nukem 3D will always be the most important to me. I ain't afraid of no Quake. Elsewhere in 1996, there were lots of sequels to games we've already talked about on this show. Descent 2 launched just one year after the original. Hot on the heels of clearing the company's mines full of deadly robots, you were assigned to clear other, worse mines full of deadlier robots. But this time you get a cute little guidebot to help you reduce the time spent staring at a map and figuring out where you need to go. The guidebot can be a little obnoxious with its constant updates about where it is and what it's doing, but it does definitely help to keep you in the game and away from the menus, which helps the whole thing feel less stop and go. Descent 2 is mostly a refinement of what came before, a faster paced, more balanced version of Descent that sands down some of the rougher edges. My one real complaint is that I still prefer the original in-game escape sequence over the CGI movie they play at the end of every level now. And this year, Marathon wrapped up with Marathon Infinity. It's the culmination of three games worth of world building, and even more than the previous titles, feels almost like a visual novel with shooter interludes. The art pieces at the start of each chapter feel like they're novel covers, and the perpetual jostling between the various AIs and alien races has all the fun of pulp sci-fi stories. The level design and plot are as labyrinthine as ever, so in some ways it's the most hostile marathon to newcomers but it's also the one that feels like it's Bungie's vision most fully realized. A story that spans millennia, across various warring factions, each with their own motivations, in which you play just one part. If you're real into epic space operas and don't mind some serious jank and egregious first-person platforming, I can't recommend this whole trilogy highly enough. And we also have Final Doom, which is basically a standalone Doom 2 expansion made by modders that has sort of been written into the canon by nature of its official release. Consisting of 64 levels split across two episodes, The Plutonia Experiment and TNT Evolution, it's notable in part for being much, much harder than Doom 2 proper. A game made by hobbyist hardcore fans was designed for their skill level, and it is, indeed, notoriously difficult. <laughs> Think of it as Super Mario The Lost Levels, but for Doom. 
It's also cool because this is a really early example of mods and user-created content being turned into a commercial product, way before, say, Counter-Strike or Team Fortress. Also in the world of Doom, there was... Chex Quest. For those here too young to remember, Chex, the boring, largely flavorless square cereal, wanted to market itself to children. So they paid a digital marketing firm to make one of those video games, what's all popular with the kids, and give it away for free on CD-ROMs in the cereal. And what the marketing team delivered was more or less just Doom reskin to be kid-friendly and promote little thatched grain squares. It's fine? It plays like an easier Doom with very boring level design. But people about my age have a lot of nostalgia for it because a full video game is a cool prize to have at the bottom of your cereal box. And they don't even do that anymore, do they? Oh god, I'm old. In retrospect though, it's pretty boring, and even at the time couldn't really hold my attention long enough to have me beat it. More than anything, it's interesting because it showed that first-person games had gone from exceedingly niche and hard to build six years prior to coming free in your cereal by 1996. Doom had popularized the genre to the point where it could be a mass marketing platform to extend your brand's reach, and if ever there was a sign of commercial pop culture domination in America, surely that's it. I also wanted to give a shout out to the Hexen expansion, Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, since I missed Hexen in my 1995 video and it really probably deserved to be in there. Once again, I have done Raven dirty. It does bring up a good point though. As we move forward with the series, I'm not going to be able to give a blurb to every FPS game that comes out, and this section at the end is going to have to start getting a little bit more curated, including missing titles that might otherwise be big hits. So keep in mind that these elsewhere sections aren't really meant to be comprehensive, so much as a snapshot of what else was going on in the first person world at the time. Anyways, Hexen built on Heretic's Doom but Medieval trappings, giving players a full class selection system and more of that gothic horror action vibe in a way that really did work. It's more melee and puzzle focused than Doom ever was, and its success mixing RPG staples with first person combat can help one understand why id thought this was the time to bring their old vision of Quake to life. Also of note to this episode is how its levels oscillate between places that feel kind of real-ish, like the first level with the tomb and the bell tower, and then back to more id-style abstract corridors and temples. And one of the classes also had a weapon where you could freeze and then shatter enemies, much like Duke Nukem. And I think it shows how much Terminator 2 really was the action movie touchstone until The Matrix came along. Speaking of action horror, we have Realms of the Haunting. Now, 1996 isn't just a fun year for FPS games, it was also probably about the peak of Sillywood. And Sillywood is its own video for another day, but suffice it to say that with the advent of CD-ROMs, developers felt obligated to fill up all 700 megabytes of space they now had access to, often with full motion video. Remember, before CDs, games came on floppies that were 1.44 megs apiece, so 700 megabytes felt like more space than anyone could ever realistically use. This coincided with the rise of new media and digital studios, and for a while there in the mid-90s, everyone thought Silicon Valley was going to be the new Hollywood. Long story short, it wasn't, but we didn't know that in 1996 when we were releasing games like the Christopher Lloyd vehicle Toonstruck, or the John Goodman Mist parody Pissed. And so we get Realms of the Haunting, which is basically just that Bram Stoker's Dracula game from a few episodes back, but good? Or, as good as a game that mixes first-person shooting with traditional point-and-click adventures can be without becoming an immersive sim. The action is serviceable, and the FMV adventure game bits are fine, and it's got a nice spooky atmosphere sometimes. What really holds this game back is that it does all of this passably, but doesn't really excel at anything, except making me love its mystery science theater grade cutscenes. Much like Duke Nukem, the game's at its best when it's simulating the familiar. Its creepy house bits hold up, but too often it becomes flapping a sword at FMV bad guys in nonsense catacombs. Still, if you ever wanted to get the peanut butter of a first-person shooter in the chocolate of your FMV adventure game, maybe it's worth a shot. It's only like $3 on Steam. And as long as we're talking about Silly Wood, it would probably be worth mentioning Looking Glass's 1996 shooter Terra Nova Strike Force Centauri. 
It is, broadly, an attempt at infusing a mech warrior or X-Wing game with a sense of being a boots-on-the-ground shooter. Like Wing Commander, it has a bunch of FMV cutscenes in between its missions to establish its universe and push its story forward, since, like a lot of these other mission-based action games, the in-game levels don't really facilitate storytelling. And like Realms of the Haunting, the cutscenes are really, really corny fun. Great trick. After the pirate prison, he was a little, uh... So SFC fitted him with these probes. He can move memories or thoughts from one person to another. I'm just saying I would love to set up an alternate channel where I could just riff this game. And like other space flight and mech sims, the menus are all diegetic, having you leave your quarters and walk around the base before taking on missions. When you do, you'll be given a mission briefing, before being allowed to choose the loadout for yourself and your squad mates. Then you drop in, execute your mission as you see fit, and extract at the rendezvous point. The game's open vistas are actually pretty striking when compared to other first-person games of this era, and the real-time reflections in the lakes and rivers are particularly nice. The game pulls in systems from MechWarrior like lasers and jump jets, while also pulling in systems from space combat games like the ability to give orders to your squad in the heat of battle. In some ways, between the wide open levels, the focus on tactics, and the squad-based combat, this could be seen as something like a precursor to military sims like Delta Force, or later, Arma. At the end of the day, it feels like a 90s sci-fi channel movie being told via a mech warrior game running at two times speed, but also, that kind of sounds like it's a lot of people's specific kind of awesome. It took me a few levels to warm up to it, but it's kind of neat. Then there's Strife, this year's entry into the if this show were about immersive sims, this is probably what I'd be covering category. Strife feels like it wants to be the modern, shooter-focused version of an immersive sim, even though that whole concept wouldn't really be solidified for over a decade with games like Prey and Square Enix's Deus Ex titles. You play as a nameless character who joins an underground resistance that is attempting to overthrow an evil cult that has taken over the world. Welcome to the last flicker of hope. The game doesn't have linear levels that progress the story, instead doing something like a hub world full of friendly NPCs and shops with level transitions out to where the action happens. And even then, you start many of those levels with no hostile enemies, letting you sneak around a bit and scope the place out. Sorry, no. I wouldn't really call it a stealth system per se, but more of a you can choose to delay how long it takes for combat to start proper kind of thing. The game has a 90s cartoon vibe to it, between the hand-drawn portrait art of important characters and the over-the-top narration. Ah, a surfacer in need of a favor. Down here you do a favor to get a favor, and I need the town entrance that is our path to food opened. And it's paced surprisingly well, especially for a game with a more open approach to level design. You encounter new enemies and story beats pretty regularly. I will say that the female voice in your head, Blackbird, probably should have been the protagonist of the game. Like, there's a story reason she isn't, and I don't want to spoil that, but you're a nameless character who never speaks, and yet she, a person not even in the room with you, provides running commentary Duke Nukem style from off screen somewhere. Oh, yuck, I don't even want to think about what you're stepping in. If nothing else, it really underscores how we hadn't figured out the voice acting thing just yet, and how Duke Nukem really solidified some of that. Also in 1996, there was Alien Trilogy, released for DOS, the Sega Saturn, and the PlayStation. I chose to look at the PSX version, and I have to say I adore the lo-fi look it's got going on. The short draw distance and black fog are almost certainly a limitation of the hardware, but it creates this wonderfully oppressive mood. <laughs> Unfortunately, the mood falls apart when the Xenomorphs are actually on screen. Combat in this game is a twitchy, action-y affair that really undercuts the tension of being hunted by these animals, which wouldn't really be captured until Alien Isolation in 2014. Still, I dug the game's pixelated Hadley's Hope energy, and it feels way more playable today than the Aliens vs. Predator title from the Jaguar a few years prior. Finally, while it's not really a game of note per se, I wanted to bring up Epidemic. 
First, because it's a Japanese first-person shooter. Coverage of this era of shooters gets dominated by a lot of American companies, especially American companies in Texas, but it's important to realize that the first-person perspective was being explored all over the world. And in some ways, Epidemic is very Japanese. It is extremely story-focused in a way that you simply did not see in American action-focused first-person titles of the time. Long before the Gigari virus, I carried the grave concern that one day mankind would be faced with its own extinction. Its story is mostly anime sci-fi nonsense, in a world where people live in megacities underground to protect themselves from a world they ruined above, you play as a protagonist whose girlfriend is ill with an incurable virus, and the only hope is a flower that grows on the surface. To get it, you'll need to pilot a giant mech against the security forces of the AI what controls this dystopia and save her. And that's like, part one of the entire sprawling plot. And it's all told through delightful mid-90s FMV CGI cheese, and I love it. It's it's terrible, and it's the greatest thing ever. Well, look who the hell it is. What do you know? You're alive after all. You too, huh? Listen, Jim, what's going on these days over in Visa? I need some information. So you finally made up your mind to come back, huh? Well, no. Not exactly. What's not exactly supposed to mean? What are you talking about? I also love how the game over screen almost feels like something out of Tim and Eric. But the other reason I bring this game up is that it uses a few forms of auto-aim. That's not really new, per se. Duke Nukem and Doom both had aim assists to help with the fact that keyboard input is insufficient for vertical aiming, and a little finicky compared to a mouse. But especially with just a D-pad, using one input to turn and to aim just felt inefficient. You either turned fast enough to make navigation easy, but then aiming was really difficult, or you turned slower in a way that made precise combat possible, but made navigation a slog. This game's auto-aim feature was one of many attempts to try to counter that on consoles. And continuing on with those two themes of Epidemic, next time we're going to talk about a title that was A, not a first-person shooter made in Texas, or even America, and B, also made an attempt to figure out how to get first-person controls to work on a console in an era before dual analog sticks. Next time, we're taking a look at GoldenEye 007.